Welcome to the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Bernstein. Uh, today, we got one of my all-time favorite people. I mean, this is, he's like family to me. Uh, he is a legend and a true American hero, uh, retired DEA uh, superstar agent, Frank Panessa. Frank, thank you for joining me. Hey, how you doing, Scott? Uh, and uh, this guy has lived a, some people have lived one movie script. Some people have lived two. Frank has lived 20. Um, we've had him on the show before, uh, just audio. I don't think we've ever had a video. Uh, and if people remember our, our past uh, appearances to, or Frank's past appearances on the show, him and I have worked together for the last couple of years in developing his uh, autobiography, which uh, is right now called The Chameleon, and then a uh, accompanying hopefully a, a, a television show uh, that we've had, we've had at various stages of development over the last three or four years with some pretty big people. Um, and, and I know one way or the other, we're going to, we're going to get it to the finish line. Uh, but right now I want to kind of allow Frank to tell a story about it. You know, people that are fans of us, uh, of the, of the show and the pod know that we love to kind of find a mix and match of history and modern day and try to find kind of connection points. Right now, there's a lot of news out of what I call the Great White North uh, up in Montreal. Uh, a lot of stuff uh, uh, re uh, revolving around the Rizzuto crime family uh, and uh, the Hells Angels and uh, Everybody has been at war with each other over the last 10, 15 years, very unstable. And Frank, and I'm going to shut up and just turn it over to Frank in, in 10 seconds. Uh, Frank, in a, in a, uh, a, 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 such a, a career, such an accoladed career, uh, a guy that was common, so many commendations, so many major cases for people that might not know. He was the, uh, Pizza Connection case. He broke the Pizza Connection open, the entire heroin pipeline coming from Sicily into the uh, East Coast uh, pizza parlors with the Bonanno crime family and uh, Cesare Bonaventure and uh, Gatano Battlementi. That was his case. Uh, but he also did undercover work around the globe. Uh, and part of his undercover work took him to Montreal, uh, where he infiltrated the Catroni Contrera uh, group, which were the precursors to the Rizzutos. That's my <laughs> that's my preamble. Frank, take it away. Tell us the story. Yeah. Well, let's start in uh, a famous meeting in Sicily in 1957, where Joe Bonanno, Carmine Galante, Lucky Luciano, uh, uh, Badalamente, they meet at the Palms Hotel in Sicily. And it was determined that the Bonanno family would control all of the heroin going into the United States, that they would have complete control of heroin distribution to the families in the United States. So uh, what had happened was uh, one of the first things that they did, uh, Carmine Galante went to Canada and he got involved with Frank Catroni. And the big thing that Carmen Galante was doing at the, at the time, Carmen Galante was a psycho, and he used uh, strong arm tactics throughout his whole, his whole life. So in Canada, he was in charge of all the gambling, and he was bringing in about $50 million a year for the Catronis. But because of his strong arm tactics, he was kicked out of Canada. They kicked him out of Canada. The Catronis continued to bring in through Badalamente and uh, other, other major Sicilians, including the Dosti brothers, Frank Dosti, who was grew up with uh, Catroni. So he was his like his capo. So Frank, I want to interrupt you for one second. We're taught you mentioned Frank Catroni. So there were there were a number of Catronis. They oh, all Catroni worked together. Brothers. Right. There was Vic Catroni, who was the godfather, the godfather. Uh, who they called him the egg. 
And then his baby brother was Frank Catroni, who you just referenced. That's who, who I'm talking who, about. Who became a very uh, a major shot caller in the Montreal uh, Mafia on behalf of his older brother uh, and was right. running, running point for his uh, older brother in that organization on a lot of the narcotics rack. Yes, and and uh, when I'm referring, I'm referring to Frank Catroni and Frank Dosti, who right. was his capo. And you have and and after they after Catroni died, of course, the Rizzutis, uh, uh, Rizzutos took over. That faction took over that part of it. But anyway, now me as an agent in New York in 1968, 1969, we see. Major violators in New York, like Guido Pinosi, meeting with the Canadians. Now, in uh, I, I'm I'm trying to think. In and Pinosi, 19- Pinosi was a Gambino, right? Yeah, he was mistaken. Gambino. They called him the Bull Guido the Bull Pinosi. Guido the Bull Pinosi, and he was with Gambino, and and there were meetings between um, uh, Paolo Gambino, who's the brother of Carlo Gambino. Pinosi and Frank Dosti, okay? And it was all about doing heroin deals. So we had a surveillance, and I think I'm one of the few people left from the 1969 surveillance of Dosti coming to uh, New York, staying at the Park Sheridan Hotel, okay? And he meets with Guido Pinosi. So we 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 were already on Pinosi, but apparently they must have felt the heat because again he came back in um, in May of '69 and again met with uh, uh, Paolo Gambino and Guido Pinosi, and the word was they were doing a 12 kilo heroin deal because of the heat. The deals didn't go down, but we got word that Pinosi was going to drive to Montreal. So we figured he's going to pick it up. And then instead of them bringing it down, uh, he was going to go to Montreal. So he had a Lincoln, and he was having it serviced at Park Lincoln Mercury. I'll never forget uh, at uh, the Manhattan Yonkers line. So we figured one of our bosses uh, says, you know, I know how he's going to get the heroin back into the United States. He's going to put it in the tires of the Lincoln. And so somebody says, it's going to melt if he puts it in. But anyway, the boss says, I want the serial numbers off the tires. So midnight, the, the doors must have been open at Park Lincoln Mercury because we went right in. And got the serial numbers off the tires. Okay. We follow Pinosi to Montreal. And of course, when he's coming back, you know, customs are going to check the serial numbers on the tires and of course toss the car, but it was clean. There wasn't anything in it. But the following year, Dusty sends down uh, his. His guy that distributed heroin, his name was um, oh oh Lucian Lucian Madre, I think it was uh, M A D E R E Madre, and Lucian Madre, and we have surveillance of him him meeting with Paul Odo, who was in, well, John, in, uh, yeah the Odo there was oh there was an Odo brothers too Johnny Bat Beach Odo yeah, and yeah those exactly. guys. He meets with them at the Sheridan Hotel. We pop them, and in Madera's car, we get 10 kilos of heroin. Okay? So it's I feel that during that two-year period, they were bringing a load of heroin into the United States, and we were missing it. You know, we, we, were, we were lucky to, to capture these three meetings and to follow uh, Guido up to, to Montreal. So they were doing major heroin. Did, did you and actually, did you get to go, you went up to Montreal oh, yeah. personally? Can you talk yeah, about what we, the, 
What was the landscape like up there? And, and kind of compare and contrast oh, it. To, in, I, I didn't go into Montreal. Oh, you didn't go oh, over the border? No, 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 no. We okay. followed him up to the line. Up to the line, all right. Yeah, uh, and, and he went into Canada. And then there were reports by the um, uh, the Canadian Mounted Police of, of the surveillance. Yeah. But I personally didn't go into Canada. Did you did you ever, uh, I know you said Dosti came down to New York. Did, yeah, we were did, on surveillance on Dosti at the Park Sheridan in, in, in 1969, uh, two times in 69. As I say, the first time uh, uh, he met, uh, with um, uh, Guido Pinosi. The second time in August of 69, he met with Guido Pinosi and Paolo Gambino. And are you are you saying that Paolo Gambino was Carlo's brother or was he one yeah. of the cut was one of the cut? No, his never... brother. I think he was his brother. Well, because there was also the cousins that were the Cherry Hill Gambinos. Oh, no, I knew them. You're saying that separate, Years okay? Later, I knew them, but for some reason. It's Paolo. I'm positive it was uh, his brother, Paolo. It must have been a brother. But then in August of that uh, of that year, we, we find Frank Dusty at, um, oh, I'm trying to think who passed, who was killed. Oh, uh, um, oh, what was his name? It was, you were, oh, you saw Jimmy Palmieri was murdered in 71, and he was part of the uh, Lucchese family. Okay. Palmieri. Right. And we find Frank Dosti at his funeral in 71. So we had three, I, I had three occasions to see Dosti in New York. It was J Jimmy Palmieri? We're talking about Johnny Palmieri. Jimmy Palmieri. Jimmy Palmieri. Yeah, and you you surveilled the um the, the, the wake funeral, the, the wake. wake where where was it at? I'm pretty sure it was in Brooklyn. I can't remember. You know, going back to 1971. And he, I think they called him Jimmy Higgins. I think that was no, his nickname. Uh, no, he was called um, um, oh uh, Jimmy. Called something else. I can't think of it. I know that Jimmy Jimmy Higgins was one of his aliases. Jimmy, Nonetheless, he what? was a Gambino drug lieutenant. Yeah. Uh, okay. And the the notion. It's also. I I want to get your take on this, Frank. It's interesting to think about. You know, when Carlo was the the Godfather, obviously everybody had the. You know the lip service towards uh, no drugs, but everybody knew that a lot of these godfathers that were espousing oh, yeah. oh, no yeah. drugs were actually benefiting greatly from drugs. The Carlo Gambino, his own family, you know, oh, the Terry Hill Gambino, right, we're doing this. But then, ten years later, you had Paul Castellano that ostensibly wanted to kill Gotti and his guys for 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 yeah, dealing exactly. dope. So, yeah. at, did you at the time was it something that like you realized in? in regards to the Italians that you were working that on one hand it was considered a, a cardinal sin, but on the other hand, like on one hand you're hearing from, uh, tell me if I'm wrong. On one hand, you're hearing from sources that the, the powers that be are saying it's a cardinal sin to deal. But then on the other hand, you're seeing all those people that are being told it's a cardinal sin to deal I, 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 actually dealing. And I'm buying dope from them. Right, right. That's the thing. But um, uh, it, it, w it was interesting because they all said, no, no, they're not involved. And as I say, I was involved with probably all five families, all five families. doing dope, you know, uh, in, in New York at the time. And um, uh, I, I, as I say, the Cherry Hill Gambinos, were very much involved in and the then a, another interesting tie uh frank i'm not sure if you're aware of this but Pinosi, his drug dealing activity took him coast to coast oh yeah he was involved with the 
shakedown of Wayne Newton too. Right, and that right shakedown of Wayne Newton in, in Vegas, Los Angeles. I mean, in, in Las Vegas, but also in LA. I have a bunch of DEA reports. I did a little. I did a little article on this um, a couple of years ago, but uh, I have a bunch of D DEA reports about how Pinosi was supplying cocaine to like the entire uh, sitcom lineup on ABC, which in the which in the seventies was huge. It was like yeah. Mork and Mindy, Happy Days, yeah. Laverne and Shirley, uh, and he had a guy. Um, I can't remember his name, but he's the, he played the dad on, uh, on Laverne and Shirley. He played Laverne's dad. Oh yeah. 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 I know. His name was Phil, Phil something. Yeah, I like that his last Phil, name. I know who you mean. He had, and, he was buddies with Pinosi. Uh, right. He had a restaurant. He was buddies with Pinosi and Pinosi would come into LA from New York with a bunch of dope. And, uh, they, they, they take him on, on into the studio and he'd be supplying Robin Williams and all the people yeah. on, oh, on uh, happy days and uh, Mork and Mindy. It, it, uh, it It's crazy to hear you talk about Guido Pinosi from that aspect in New York. And then yeah. knowing that in that same time period, he's, he's supplying guys, uh, you know, uh, actors oh, and was, actresses that like, were, were like American icons. He was a mover and a shaker. Yeah. And I honestly believe they were bringing in so much heroin from Montreal. I mean, we were missing it. Let's face it. We were missing a lot of it. Uh, and, and we were lucky when, when we got this guy, uh, Lucian uh, Madere and, and Odo, uh, with the 10 kilos. You know, So you can imagine every time Lucian came down uh, from Montreal, he was carrying at least 10 kilos. The, guy, the um, actor's name was Phil Foster. I just looked. I don't think Phil that was just. That's who. I don't was. think that was his real name. I think he had an Italian surname, yeah. but he, his stage name was Phil Foster. Exactly. Yeah. Now you know all the other big names too during this time frame. You know, Badalamente was very much involved. Buscetta, uh, Tommaso Buscetta was very much involved. You had actually the pizza restaurants already going. You know, I didn't get involved into the pizza restaurants until uh, 83. But way before that, they had all the uh, the distribution restaurants around the United States. And the one interesting thing that we saw that the Sicilian mafia controlled all the heroin importation and they supplied the American mafia families with the heroin. People don't understand that there's two mafias, you know, the Sicilian and the American mafia, and they use one another for their own profits. And the American mafia was also using the zips, as we call them, the people that work in these pizza shops to do hits for them, too. You know, well, they were Sicilians that had come over to America uh, to work for some of these American crime families, and then they kind of became in some cases, uh, many crime families within bigger crime families, oh, yes. uh, very insular. And I, I want to segue this for you. Uh, I, we'll go for another 10, uh, 10, 20 minutes. And uh, for let people know that Frank had a uh, alias, a uh, an undercover persona known as Frankie Pizza, uh, Frankie Pagano, who they called Frankie Pizza. Uh, obviously, Donnie Brasco gets a lot more uh, publicity, but just so, and we've said this before if, for people that were listening, I don't know if people on YouTube have heard it, but there would be no Donnie Brasco if it wasn't for Frankie Pizza, Frankie Pagano. I don't say that with um, any uh, slight against Joe Pistone, but, but Frank, you know, he wrote the book literally on federal uh, undercover law enforcement uh, and how to go after the, the Italian mafia and laid a lot of the, planted a lot of the seeds um, in the early 70s for what became the FBI uh, Donnie Brasco uh, investigation into the Bananos in, in the late 70s, early 80s. And Frank was dealing, literally and figuratively, uh, had got his hooks into uh, subordinates of Cesare Bonventri, who was the, the main zip 
uh, Bonanno Capo yeah. had been Carmine Galante's bodyguard. Uh, yeah, was I involved into, in a conspiracy uh, to murder we were, Galante. Uh, we were into Cesare Bonaventre and uh, Baldo Amato. Yeah. And um, and they were distributing the heroin through the pizza shops. And I, I got involved in Philadelphia in the pizza shops. And the heroin was coming straight from Baldo, uh, from uh, Cesare Bonaventure. And um, in, in a year's time, I bought over a million dollars worth of heroin uh from from the bonanno family you know cesare bonaventure and all the people that were involved with him and uh, of course uh you had castellano in brooklyn and they controlled uh you know all the distribution in new york um i don't yeah, know if people interesting time i don't know if people know i learned this from actually from frank um part of i mean i think everybody knew that Part of that pizza connection. I mean, it's not a, it's not breaking news or anything. Uh, everybody knew that part of that pizza connection, which was centered around the Bonanos, um, it, Manhattan, Brooklyn, uh, and obviously they were spread across New Jersey. They were involved with the the, uh, the, the Gambino and the Cherry Hill uh, group. But I don't know if people realize that some of Bonaventure's guys, these Sicilian um, gangsters, were in Philadelphia, not working for Nikki Scarfo or Phil Testa or Angelo Bruno, but working for the Bonanos in Philly. Uh, Dominic Massimino, I believe, was one of the big ones. They called him Mimi, Mimi Massimino. Yeah. Uh, and he owned a lot of those pizza parlors, but he was based yeah. in Philly. Dominic Menino, too. That, that's what I'm sorry. I meant, Dominic I didn't mean Massimino. I meant Dominic yeah. Menino, who they called Mimi. I was confusing him with yeah. Miles Joe uh, Mousy Massimino. No, uh, Dominic Menino, aka Mimi, who was Cesare's main guy in Philly. I didn't even know that the Bonanos had a group in Philly, but but Frank yeah. was working them. And yeah. Frank was and tell them, Frank, tell them. I, I I apologize for people that might have heard some of the audio in, in the years past, but I want Frank to tell it for the for the new video audience. Um, but tell them how your uh, entry point for for some of these uh, guys uh, in the Bananos was pretending like you were a a Scarfo lieutenant. Yeah, and they, well, back then there were there it was a lot more difficult to backtrack things back then, and you played the role, and they thought you were a capo under Nicky Scarfo. Tell, and they never them. questioned it. Right. it. It was so good. Uh, we had arrested we had arrested two wise guys in Philadelphia, two uh, Bruno people. And so we're, we're saying, hey, you know, you're going to go to jail if you don't cooperate. So they said, well, we're not going to give you anybody in the Bruno family. So I said to them, well, what about the Sicilians? And so the one guy says to me, well, they're not Italian. Yeah. yeah we, <laughs> they're, not they're not Italian like us. They're yeah. Sicilian. We, um, so we came up with the story that I was – a made guy in Philadelphia, and I was in charge of all hijacking because we knew they had cigarette machines. They had 80 cigarette machines in restaurants around Philadelphia. You know, when you walked into the into the vestibule, you had the machine where you pulled uh, uh, the, the lever to get the cigarettes. Well, they had 80 of them. So these guys approach one of the Bonanno people and say, hey, you know, this guy, Frankie Pagano, uh, just hijacked a big shipment of cigarettes. Would you be interested in it? And so, of course, they said, yeah. So at the time, they were paying $7.10 a carton, legitimately buying the cigarettes to put in their machines. So what we came up with the idea, we would offer them the cigarettes at $4 a carton, write off the $3.10 a carton as an investigative expense and make me somebody. So they set up a meeting to meet with the Sicilians and the Sicilians meet us at a mob restaurant in uh, Philadelphia. Now you have me and a, an agent that was in quotes, my bodyguard behind me and these two guys from Philly. 
and the Sicilians are sitting across the table from us. And so the wise guy from Philly says to the Sicilians, this is Frankie Pagano. He's a friend of ours, meaning that I'm a made guy. If he would have said, this is Frankie Pagano, he's a friend of mine, that means I'm associated, right. but I'm not made. So the Sicilians saw this, and then, of course, the Sicilians saw these two guys serving me drinks. When the food came out, they made sure I was the first to get the food. So I, I started selling them cigarettes. And after about four or five months, you know, I did my sad face, and I said to the Sicilian, I, he says, what's wrong with me? He used to call me Cugine, a cousin. Uh, and uh, I says, well, you know, I get involved in other stuff. He says, what do you mean? I says, you know, I'm involved in white powder. Well, why didn't you tell me? We control all the white powder. So he says, who are you buying from? So at the time, I was buying off somebody in the Genovese family in New York who we hadn't arrested. So I says, oh, I'm getting it off so-and-so in, in, in the Bronx. He says, he gets it from us. From now on, you get it from us. And that's how the Pizza Connection started. Uh, uh, you know, a short time later, I made my first buy of $85,000. Uh, and I was in. And they never questioned, uh, uh, you know, who I was. And it's funny, because we used to hang out at an after hours place. And you'd have the Bruno family there, you know, with Nikki Scarfo and all of them. And I'd be with the Sicilians. So the Bruno, the Sicilians never went over to the Bruno family and says, hey, well, we're just <laughs> yeah, right. It could have gotten, well, could have gotten hairy. I would have said, take Katz and Frankie Pagano, who's he? Right. You know? <laughs> so that never happened. And there are, Everything they they confided in me. We went to Europe. We uh, we uh, we supplied them with uh, uh, Baldo uh, uh, Cesare Bonaventure with quinine, you know, to cut the heroin. Uh, it was really good. Uh, didn't, you, didn't you didn't you tell me at one point, Frank, that before? So Cesare goes down in that big pizza connection bus, but. For people that know the history of the, the pizza connection in Cesare, he didn't make it to trial. He was murdered. Oh, he never did. For insubordination. Um, he had gotten, uh, there was a lot of friction after the uh, Galante assassination and yeah. Bonaventure became, I think at the time he was the youngest capo no, uh, he was, he in was New York City. He was only 25 years old. That's and all. He, and he was a capo. Uh, See, the thing is, uh, a lot of power we, went to his head, and he started butt heads with with Phil Rostelli, who was yes, Delante's successor. Yeah, he did. But the thing was, uh, Cesare turned out to be just like Lilo Galante. He was money hungry. Right. They were making, they were bringing in a million dollars a day on the heroin trade, and yet he was shortchanging everybody below him. I remember I bought a package. Uh, from this, this is the story I wanted people to tell. Or I wanted you to tell. That's what I was leading up to. So tell the story. Yeah. They, I, that the the original heroin that I bought was 90, 90 something percent pure, which is is normal. You know, you you never get like a hundred percent, but ninety percent is pure heroin. And me as a dope dealer, I could cut that, and I could make millions of dollars with it. So I did one deal with the Sicilians, and it came back 32%. And so I complained. I says, what are you giving me this crap for? I can't make any money with this. He says, that's what Cesare gave us. And we have to take what he gives us, you know. But the Sicilian, I mean, I was their golden goose in Philadelphia. Anybody that's buying a million dollars worth of heroin right. is their golden goose. So about a week later, I meet with one of the Sicilians, and he hands me $16,000. I says, what's this? He says, well, you know, I feel bad that the last package was so bad, but I don't have any control over it. It's Cesare calls the shops. And he handed me $16,000.
Um, and but that was Cesare's downfall. Yeah, I was going to say so, I think that that played a role in some of the the cumulative. Uh, it, it was a culmination, I think, of a number of factors that led to his murder. But I know that part of the um, issue where where he was being called when Cesare was being called on the carpet and having to answer to to Rusty um, was related to. He he was rip. He wasn't. I think in some ways he might have looked at you as, you know, I don't. These are my. These are guys that are my guys that I'm giving, and and he wouldn't necessarily think possibly that it was a a slap in the face to you. He didn't know you personally. I heard he was doing this to guys that were big big shots in the Bananos were getting yeah. cheated in deals by him. Uh, and that was part of the reason Rusty uh, had him uh, at a sit down, which he allegedly let Banano. Right. Well, and and Cesare, from what I can gather, the final straw was a, a situation where he told Rusty Rustella to go fuck himself, and yeah. and stormed out of a a sit down, and That's then they true. killed him a couple of weeks later. Uh, telling him that they were taking him back to see Rusty so he could apologize or they, yeah. you know, they could make yeah. nice and they killed him. Yeah. And they chopped him up and put him in three fifty-five gallon yeah. drums. He was a tall guy. He was like six five, six yeah. six. Yeah. He was a tall Sicilian. <laughs> uh, I want to let's wrap this up with uh let's, let's keep it in Philly as we end. And I want you to tell the story and I'll call her up I'll color it up a little bit. But uh 1983 this is right before the bust is going to come down in '84, um, and you're you're out with some guys in a in a club, and the Selena brothers uh, oh, are yeah. are spotted, and and they kind of tell you something that is that's about to happen, and then it happens. It happens, yeah. We were in a, a, a private club called Club Enchanté in Cherry Hill, and as I say, you had. The Bruno people in there, Nicky Scar. Well, I, I say the Bruno family, meaning yeah. Nicky Scarfor and all those people. And you had the Sicilians, okay? And so Alberto Ficolora says, You see those two guys over there? And he points to the Selena brothers. And he says, They've shown no respect. He says, We're men of honor, and they show no respect. And that's what he said to me. A month later, they, they were both killed. Yep, Maddie and, and Toto. Yeah, um, a month apart from one another. It might have been less than a month, but around the, it, it, these, these were tough people. These Sicilians were tough. And uh, just to tie it into today, uh, Ace was eventually dropped, but initially, Joe Legambi, who would become the boss of the Philadelphia mob, uh, is now like a part-time conciliary, a very, very esteemed member of the East Coast Mafia, very, very well respected. Uh, yeah. He was indicted uh, for this murder, or for, I should say, for one of the murders. I don't know if it was for Matt, for Maddie or for, for Toto, but him and Yogi Merlino, who was the, the alleged current boss of the, of the Philly mob, Joey Merlino's uncle, uh, yeah. Yogi and Uncle Joe Legambi were indicted uh, for uh, for the murder conspiracy of the Selena brothers, I believe that they were tasked with. Um, they they played some role in in taking the body from where it was killed to where it was found. Well, they in, yeah, they put they put them in the trunk of a car. A car, yeah, and they found them in the cars. Yeah, so uh, uh, Toto Selena was found. Uh, in Deptford, uh, yeah. Juniper Court, Gloucester County, uh, was stuffed in uh, two tra two plastic trash bags in the, the in the trunk of his '79 Cadillac. Yes. Um, and then uh, Maddie uh, had been uh, had been murdered um, or had been disappeared uh, in, 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 like a month before that, I think. Um, and they found him in a trunk. He's or, or I guess he's still this as of November of eighty three he was still missing. No, but then they did find him. Right. Uh, so it's just interesting to see how uh, uh, 
Joe Legambi, who would eventually rise to pretty historic heights, uh, could have been tripped up by that murder. He yeah. was eventually convicted uh, later that in that decade of the Frankie Flowers murder, got out of that in 97 yeah. on an appeal and then uh, had his, has had his ascent. But yeah. uh, I also was told that that might have been a, a way for, for Legambi to get made was to be involved in the Selena hit. Oh, I, I, I believe that. You know, but yeah. then it took it took him another three years, though, because of uh, his connection to Chucky Merlino, and Merlino ended up getting oh. demoted. They wanted to keep Merlino's guys at a distance for a while, but it's interesting that Legambi kind of plays a role in some of this old school stuff. You know, you have to understand, during that time, I'm talking about 1982, 1983, when I was in undercover, there were 22 hits around me. Yeah. 22 people got hit. You know, talking about the Testers and, yep. of course, originally Angelo Bruno, but but then uh, Phil Testa and everybody that came His in. His son, Salvi, yeah. Yep, yep. You know? Well, Frank, this was great, man. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna bring you back again. I'm I'm excited for the for the video audience to get a look at you because we've only really been doing video for a little over a year now, um, yeah. and, and we're getting a whole new audience, whole new group of people that didn't didn't really know uh, about us when we were just audio. So we'll bring you back on, and then you'll be hearing hopefully a lot more uh, about Frank's uh, uh, project, uh, his story about his life, uh, book form, television that we're both of us are working on. To say that Frank had a storied life uh, or storied career in federal law enforcement is a, is, is a gross over, uh, understatement. He is truly a, a, a legend in – uh, DEA circles. And like I said, he, he literally wrote the book on how to do undercover work uh, at the federal level. So we, we pay a debt to Frank and uh, Hey man, thank you so much for coming on and shedding, shedding insight and, and telling everybody uh, your amazing life stories. Okay, Scott. Thank you. All right. So uh, I will see you next week. I am Scott Bernstein, another long form edition. We'll see you next week, but we'll be coming out with some quick hitters uh, every day or two as we normally do. OG Pod for Benny Behind the Glass. I am Scott Bernstein. Mm -hmm.